Welcome to Misfit Apparitions, the podcast. I'm Don. Thank you for joining me as I discuss locations we've investigated that are known for paranormal activity, as well as other subjects related to the field. You can reach us at MisfitApparitions.com, and please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and our YouTube channel with the handle at Misfit Apparitions. The podcast can be found wherever you listen to podcasts, our YouTube channel, and our website. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider giving us a like or a thumbs up and tell others about it. We would really appreciate that, and it would go a long way with the team and also helps the podcast get noticed. If you have any comments, concerns, or questions, please drop us an email at mapod at misfitapparitions.com or ask us directly from a social media platform that you feel comfortable using. There are some changes coming to the podcast, but before I talk about those changes, I want to speak about the team. Some of you already know that Misfit Apparitions is a team of five. We share a deep passion in getting together to investigate locations, but like many other teams, we also have demanding outside commitments and responsibilities. And like other teams, each of us has naturally discovered their defined roles on the team. We are well balanced with our individual strengths and weaknesses, which easily complement each other. We are also fortunate enough to be a member of the Texas chapter of Cold Spotters, an international paranormal collective based out of Canada. For our contribution to the team, Ernest and I work exclusively on evidence review. We fully enjoy it and are expectedly excited when discovering evidence we fail to debunk. The original plan for this episode was to present the findings of our Velisca Axe murder house investigation. However, a lot has happened to the podcast since then. Shortly after the release of our Malvern Manor sneak peek episode, I began a lengthy illness. During that time, our entire evidence review process slowed to a turtle's pace. Added to that was the after effects of an investigation we conducted in the middle of last month that left Ernest and I literally drained of energy for over a week, bringing evidence review to a complete halt. When we worked on the Malvern Manor sneak peek video, we believed it would be a blueprint for releasing further investigation videos via the podcast. Then when I became sick and our Velisca review slowed down, we realized it no longer made sense to apply the podcast's bi-weekly deadlines to a video production. We also discovered we could take that sneak peek blueprint, build upon it, and give our investigation videos a greater production value. We are excited about it and believe you will like the finished product. Additionally, we will also be adding a new occasional feature to the podcast. These will be stories submitted by our listeners, either via email or if they prefer a recorded phone interview, of their time living in a place where they experience any type of paranormal activity. And finally, to keep the podcast fresh, allow time to create professional-looking investigation videos, and prevent Ernest and I from burning out, effective today, the podcast will move to a seasonal format, with each season starting on the Tuesday after Labor Day and ending on the Tuesday after Memorial Day, meaning there will be four more episodes in this first season we're currently in, which will end with the Tuesday, May 30th episode release. Well, that takes care of the podcast announcements. I realize some of you may have been looking forward to our investigation video of the Velisca Axe murder house, but I believe the setbacks opened our eyes to another way forward for the podcast, while greatly improving the look and feel of our upcoming investigation videos. Please know that we very much appreciate your patience. 
In this episode, I am going to explore the most common types of hauntings paranormal teams experience during investigations, those being residual, intelligent, poltergeist, and demonic. I'll try to give examples of each from some of the investigations we have been on. Probably the most common haunting is a residual haunting. These are recordings of energy imprinted at or near a location that involve a traumatic event, such as a person's violent death, or a setting that witness a buildup of massive amounts of energy, such as a battlefield, or an unfortunate ending to a standoff. This recorded energy is a loop playing continuously sometimes, with the possibility of actually seeing apparitions and or hearing sounds from the event. These recordings are a one-way only type of communication, meaning that you can only see, hear, and sometimes smell the event. It is very similar to watching a film in a theater. Whatever you see cannot interact with you and does not see you. And an example of this is probably going to be our trip to Presidio La Bahia, where Ernest and I heard cannon fire at about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, outside atop a bastion. We thought it was thunder, but after looking at the radar, there wasn't any rain within hundreds of miles. It occurred a couple times, and we did not know what it was until we read journals from other teams that have stayed overnight that indicated they heard cannon fire, and we pretty much determined that's exactly what we heard. Civil War battlefield in Gettysburg is another good example. Soldiers going about their duties from that day. There's a lot of stories out there about that. The intelligent haunting is what many people are familiar with as it is more often seen on film. Intelligent haunting is named as such because the spirit comes across as being aware of its surroundings and is capable of interacting within their environment and communicating with those living in the physical world. Sometimes a spirit seeks attention by moving or hiding objects and responding to requests from the living. It's not known why these spirits remain where they are, but some theories suggest they stay around because of loved ones or are unaware they have died because their death may have happened suddenly or unexpectedly and therefore have not crossed over. In those cases, a medium may be necessary to assist the spirit in crossing over. Another theory is that the spirit refuses to cross over until unfinished business or a major issue is resolved. A spirit may make its presence known by the living experiencing cold spots or the feeling of being watched. Most of the time, spirits engaged in intelligent hauntings are not malicious and just want to be noticed or heard. This is the most fascinating haunting for me because it goes against everything I know about what happens to the brain when a person dies, and I am unable to come to terms with understanding how an intelligent haunting spirit is able to consciously make decisions. And I guess examples can be the EVPs that we collect from a lot of places that we visit, voices telling us to get out, some saying hey, footsteps, those sort of things that we catch a lot of at just about every location that we've been to. The next type is poltergeist. Poltergeist comes from the German words poltern, meaning to make noise, and geist, meaning ghost. Noisy ghost. These hauntings involve objects being moved, hidden or thrown, unsettling noises, electronics being interfered with, and physical attacks. A poltergeist haunting sometimes affects a person who is under considerable duress, and can eventually take its toll on the entire household or paranormal team. Poltergeists can be mischievous or malevolent, the latter capable of being harmful to the living. Most of the time, the haunting begins slowly and gradually intensifies until reaching its peak when the experience can be at its most dangerous. There are times when poltergeists stop abruptly and never repeat again. I don't know if I have an example of that in our investigations. Possibly our last investigation, I was in a location and I had a video camera focused on an object in this location and I was alone in this location. Ernest was above me in another location but could see down. It was kind of like a balcony. So as I was using my camera to shoot video, 
I watched the battery meter go from full to empty, full to empty, full to empty for about 45 seconds. It just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and the battery was fully charged before I turned on the camera. When Ernest came downstairs to the location I was in, all of that activity stopped. Not sure if that counts as poltergeist, but it was a strange moment for me. The last type of haunting is the most dangerous, the demonic haunting. A demon's main goal is to break down a person's free will in order to possess them. But it cannot only possess people, it can attach itself to objects. In the beginning, this type of haunting seems friendly or non-threatening, often appearing similar to a poltergeist haunting. The demon may appear as a dark shadow or show itself as a benevolent spirit. When it finally reveals itself, it may be in the form of repugnant odors, extreme temperature changes, and physical attacks. It has the ability to alter itself and shapeshift from human to animal. It may attempt to convince an individual that it's no longer present, but instead waits to strike when that individual is helpless or weak. A possession can occur if the demon senses fear. Signs of a possessed individual include the individual speaking in tongues or having gained knowledge in subjects they knew nothing about before. As you might expect, this type of haunting is not easily resolved. It requires an exorcism. The only demonic haunting that we may have experienced was at a location where Ernest had seen green eyes, and it was known that this location had a demonic. That, to my knowledge, is the only one. And in a video that was shot, it's clearly shown that Ernest is looking at something and trying to figure out what it is, which was the green eyes. That will do it for this episode. I know it's a short one, and we appreciate you taking the time to listen. I do have one more announcement. Through our connections in Cold Spotters, the team was invited to join Beyond Life Paranormal Research Missouri for a two night investigation of the Beatty Mansion in St. Joseph, Missouri this September. Unfortunately, we had to decline because of unknown probable commitments that time of year. Having said that, the next possible out of state investigation for the team will be in December. However, we are hoping to conduct residential investigations between now and then, as just about every member of the team has been approached by an individual expressing interest in our service, which, by the way, costs nothing. So if any listeners out there within the states of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, or Louisiana believe there's paranormal activity going on in their residence, please let us know. Again, absolutely no cost. And finally, Remember, it's not always the things in your life that matter, but it's the memories. Cherish those and those you make them with. See you next time on the podcast. Goodbye.